ladies and gentlemen, I'm stoked to be here. Uh, whatever befalls Earth befalls the children of Earth, Chief Seattle. Uh, what we are faced with is uh, the largest problem human created in the history of our species. Uh, there is no doubt that what we uh, are seeing is human uh, created, but there is every reason to believe that our innovation, uh, we uh, human beings are problem solvers, we are tool makers, and all we want is to have at it. We have the highest concentration of brain power in the world, in the United States, at our colleges and our universities. And I have said it before on national TV, and I will say it again, there is nothing that we cannot solve. There are industries to be created. You will start to hear more and more the term future proofing because that's what we need to do to address our water issues, our, the droughts that are facing our planet, and the challenges to feed 7 billion people, which incidentally in a decade will be 8 billion people. That's a lot of oxygen, extra oxygen that we have to be aware of to create. Last week, the, um, the draft for the National uh, Climate Assessment was released, uh, and make no mistake, we are faced with more intense droughts, more intense heat waves, uh, greater highs, greater lows, uh, flooding, uh, epic amount of ice loss, and our oceans are acidifying uh, very quickly, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We have to begin to be aware of this. Uh, we have to future-proof our uh, uh, coastal communities. And here's a, a terrific example of why North Carolina, the oceans are uh, forecasted to uh, rise at least three feet over the next uh, four to five decades. In this case, it's brought seawater into a uh, freshwater river to a forest as salt salinity is deadly unless you're uh, specially adapted the mangroves these are not mangroves and our forests are copying it hurricanes and uh, our uh, flooding situation this summer in august uh, we lost power on the hudson river and raw sewage from the um, new york system pumped uh, uh, millions of gallons of sewage into the river, which then went into our ocean. Later, with uh, Superstorm uh, uh, Sandy, we lost our sewage system, and uh, for two weeks after Sandy, raw sewage was pumped, in, pumped through the Hudson and uh, into the ocean. Again, the, we need to begin to future-proof our uh, coastal communities and our inland communities. These are uh, challenges that are ahead of us. The Obama administration is well advised on what is ahead and uh, on behalf of many of the climate scientists that I've been working with over the last 20 years, we were all rather elated last week to hear that it is going to be a priority for the Obama administration over the next four years, and not a moment too soon. What we're seeing now are extremes that are well beyond uh, natural vari variability. The last four months of uh, 2012 were extremely hot and extremely dry in Australia. On the 4th of January, Hobart had a record temperature, Hobart down here at 107 degrees uh, and on the 7th of um, January three weeks ago the uh, average temperature across the entire continent was uh, 107.2 degrees they've never it shattered all of the records uh, since the continuous records since 1910 on the 8th of January a heat dome formed over the continent and it shattered the, up until that point, the highest temperature ever recorded in Australia was 121.3. On January the 8th, the temperature exceeded 123.7, causing the Met Bureau to uh, have to extend the temperature range 
uh, higher than they'd ever extended from 122 to 129. They had to add uh, deep purple and pink to the weather map never before experienced. Australia, unfortunately, has been a beacon of uh, climate change battering. They have gone from uh, an epic drought and fires, hellacious fires, over the last month to uh, two weeks of torrential rain, uh, particularly up in Queensland. And the concern there is, of course, that's their food growing region. And what we're seeing with climate disruption now is uh, we're running the gambit of a global food security, being able to provide enough food on Earth. Incidentally, in the state of Victoria here, uh, as of uh, last week, they had never seen, uh, they have never seen the situation where the temperatures are so hot, the plants are so confused, the honeybees had, uh, up until last week, had produced zero honey. The, uh, this, is, uh, this is because the plants are, as I use the term, discombobulated and not producing nectar because it's so hot and pollen, so the bees, of course, can't uh, cross-pollinate or collect nectar. We need the bees. The bees pollinate our food. They give us our cotton. They give us a lot of medicine. And uh, they're also telling us as a telltale uh, that things are not happy. Now, what we have learned from the past are some very interesting things. I want to look at one culture in particular, the Mayan culture. The Mayans uh, came on the map at about 2500 BC and they flourished for about 1200 years. This is a culture that uh, they, ha they had a very good insight on geometry, on astronomy, and they were exceptional water managers because they are, they started on the Yucatan Peninsula, then they moved in, uh, on to most of Middle America, but they were able to thrive with uh, very little topsoil and uh, somehow be contending with the Caribbean hurricane season and, uh, and with a water shortage. They were terrific water managers, as a matter of fact. And they, have distinct, they had distinct wet and dry seasons. And what they would do when it was the dry season, they also, I might add, uh, built some uh, incredible monuments, uh, Chichen Itza and elsewhere. They were, uh, we believe they were a lot of religious monuments, uh, pyramid styled. They had, they built them without any steel. And they built them with human hands. During the dry season, what would happen is the, uh, all of the surrounding uh, clans would come into the little centers, Chichen Itza for instance, and the shamans knew that the topography of the land, there were little sinkholes, they called them chultons, and they would have enough water for 25 people, and they used uh, water lilies to determine that the water was potable, able to be consumed, and the shamans would use the water on behalf of the nobles to bring the people in, and they would give them water, they would have food, and the people in turn would build the monuments. And then all of a sudden, something happened. Well, what, did, what, what we see happen here is uh, there were three sets of droughts, three, six, and nine year events, and they're cumulative, and on the third event, a uh, very powerful culture on planet Earth vaporized. We believe with the, uh, the droughts, the shamans lost the ability to draw the people into the uh, cities. And uh, at first war took place, then uh, famine set in, then disease wiped them off the face of the earth. Drought is something we cannot take lightly, and uh, we have been faced with it. Last summer, this is a July, we had 62% of the lower 48 in some kind of a drought. Uh, in particular, the, the real concern was the Corn Belt, South Dakota, coming down into the Texas area. And of course, our corn, soybean, and even the cotton region uh, copped it pretty hard. Our, our 
crop yields were off 30, 35, 38 percent. In January, uh, early this year, uh, the lower 48, there were 42 percent of the lower 48 was, is still in drought. So this drought hasn't gone away, it's, it persists. The corn belt it not only gives us uh, feed for our livestock, but our sweeteners in so many of our foods and ingredients for our paints and, uh, and many other uh, things that we use. So we have to be very, very aware of what's going on. Now, speaking of what's going on <clears throat> with drought, we're seeing that uh, usually in the Amazon basin, the Amazon basin is a basin where it's the hotbed of life. Our tropical forests yield some of the most potent cancer medicines and foods that uh, our planet has to offer. They rarely experience drought, uh, maybe 150 year events. Uh, here we see two things happened in 2005. We had a drought that was uh, 660,000 square miles. Uh, but just before that drought happened in the summer, uh, we had a windstorm that ripped through the forest and leveled about a half a billion mature trees. The main concern of the windstorm is around the equator, uh, our old equator, this zone right in here, it's a windless zone, the intertropical zone of convergence it, because of it, it cops the most amount of heat from the sun and the oceans and the uh, pressure patterns disperse the heat to the respective poles. But at the equator, we just don't see wind. We don't see wind, so trees, like any other thing in nature, doesn't expend energy in an area that they don't need to. And in particular, the roots of the big trees are not like the roots of our dug firs and uh, coastal redwoods in the Pacific Northwest that are colossal trees and have phenomenal root systems because they have to contend with 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. So we lost about a half a billion trees and then a, a big old drought came along and uh, we lost um, plus or minus about 800 million trees that year. Then, that's a one in 100 year event, a drought. Then five years later, we had a drought that now covered half the Amazon basin, 1.3 million square miles. And of the 1.3 uh, million square miles, it overlapped to about 220,000 square miles of the 2005 drought. And, uh, and it killed upwards of 1.2 billion trees. What I want to bring to your attention here is that forests are evolved to draw CO2, the main greenhouse gas, out of the atmosphere. So now we've got a couple billion trees here that are dead. They're not drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere as they decompose. In fact, they're bleeding. Uh, these greenhouse gases to the tune of about 13 billion um, tons of greenhouse gases. To put that in per perspective, in the United States, we emit about 5.4 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. This is a very serious situation, not just because they're bleeding now greenhouse gases. The Amazon basin, this wonderful machine down here, that hugs part of the equator, also each and every day is a cloud making machine. It rains every day, they make their own clouds. They, they're the most phenomenal recycling climate forest system that we know of. Those clouds are white. White is a very important surface on a, our warming planet because the white area that was there reflected incoming solar radiation. We're losing ice at the, at the pole, at the respective poles, and ice on the few remaining uh, South American uh, glaciers and glaciers around the world. And so uh, Earth essentially is not cooling off at night. What's next? Oh yes, blue whales. 
I love blue whales. Uh, blue whales, on average, weigh about 125 tons. Um, Matt King's lab at the University of Tasmania dispelled there was this notion by the disinformation machine that went on until Matt stepped forward this summer and said, hey, wait a minute, this just isn't right. The West Antarctic, down over here, towards the crooked handle, this crooked handle down here, is losing 190 million tons of ice every day. An unfathomable number, if I put it in terms of blue whales, that's a million and a half blue whales of ice a day that we're losing. And uh, over a calendrical year, that's well over a half a trillion blue whales of ice. So we can definitely see, and we know, and we're measuring around the world, that the sea level is definitely rising. Again, uh, it, it is something that we, will, we are and we will begin to future-proof. The other very concerning thing is since the 1950s, this comes from NOAA, the oceans have increased in acidity 30%. When I wrote uh, the, the Insatiable Bark Beetle in 2011, uh, CSI wrote and University of Tasmania and Matt King's group uh, had uh, been watching this increase in acidity and said, oh my, this is, this, we've never seen this. This is the fastest we've seen in 2011 in uh, 60 million years. And that's an o to me, that was an OMG. Last year, Matt and uh, CSIRO, the Australian science body, and uh, the University of Tasmania revisited these numbers. The oceans are now acidifying uh, faster than they have in the last 300 million years. So the $64,000 question to those that aren't in oceanic sciences, well, why are they acidifying and what does that mean? As there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, the remaining uh, oceanic phytoplankton, and we're missing a lot of it, you see as the Earth has begun to warm and the, co and the currents are changing, part of the way that the uh, oceanic plant life derives its nutrients is from upwelling, and currents come up, particularly off the uh, coast of, uh, I, I mean for this to be uh, South America, it might be Africa, my geography might be a little off, sorry. But the upwelling process has, has stopped in some areas, and we've actually lost, uh, since the 1950s, 40% of the uh, oceanic phytoplankton. But the remaining plankton has absorbed so much CO2 that as a process, a byproduct of the photosynthesis in the water, it releases a carbonic acid, just a weak little acid. But so much weak acid has been released the oceans have in increased in acidity at, a, at a, an alarmingly fast rate. Now, for those that enjoy lobster, shellfish, or any seafood, this is a very big concern because these critters have an exoskeleton or a shell that is a calcium carbonate that cannot deal with acid. In other words, their shells, if nothing is done, uh, run the gamut over the next 10 years, if acidity continues to increase, they will melt. And, okay, you say, oh, well, that's, you know, so I won't eat lobster. But the, that's not how nature works. Nature is a, is a pyramid of life. And when we lose uh, uh, lobsters, that means that the other predators, the cod, uh, and then that, that amplifies up the food chain to whales and the toothed whales and dolphins, they don't get to eat. These are very, very serious situations. As a matter of fact, I'm told that President Obama is m probably more concerned about the acidity than anything else because it's not that easy to rectify. Okay, uh, the UK. Um, the UK, last, uh, up until last May, the UK was in a drought. And they, it was so dry that, as a matter of fact, they were very concerned for the Olympics how they were actually going to wash the double-decker buses so they'd look good on TV and et cetera, et cetera. Then along came, uh, along came 
June and it started to rain and it didn't stop raining. And I want to just show you how our wonderful planet is interconnected. It didn't stop raining so much so that all of the homegrown UK vegetables and all of the apple trees and plum trees uh, uh, either didn't grow at all or uh, bore such uh, minimal amounts of fruit that the UK during the summer had to import a mega amount of food. Part of what is happening when we remove the Arctic sea ice, we last uh, September, last August, we reached, a, uh, we measured the sea ice uh, in the first week of September, but last year it was so warm that in the middle of August we had already broken the record. We'd lost 1.3 million square miles of ice. Remember the ice is white and remember that white surface reflects incoming solar radiation. Well, part of the problem with unleashing our Arctic Ocean is not that we're going to try and get more oil and gas. That's not the, the situation. Up, up on the, the top of our globe, as well as the bottom, we have this upper air river or the, the jet stream. It's a polar jet stream. The polar jet stream usually has six to eight uh, dips uh, like a snake, the sinuous movement, and it carries the weather around the top of our northern hemisphere. Last summer, what drove, what occurred is one of these polar jet streams took a way deep dip, and when it did that, oh, Britain down here copped it really hard. Uh, it brought torrential, torrential rains. I'm sure some of us remember that. Now, I love bees. I couldn't help but uh, I, I mentioned that the bees stayed in their hives and they uh, shivered to death. There was no honey, they died. So in 2011, we look at our honey per hive and we had about 30 pounds per hive. In 2012, uh, due to the rain, we only had eight pounds on average per hive. It's a drop of 72%. Incidentally, eight pounds, the, the reason that the hive has honey is not so we can go to our honey pot and have honey on our toast. The honey is, is, is rocket fuel for the bees and that's what sustains them over the winter months because half the hive, about 50,000, the hive is like a city and about half the city dies, naturally, and half the city hangs around with the queen, and they do what the emperor penguins do all winter long. They have the queen here and all the other bees with a big ball around her inside, and they shiver on mass, but they shiver as a pulse, and they use a thermal mass of 50,000 insects uh, generating heat so that their almighty queen, the, the uh, focal of the hive, can be healthy and survive and begin to lay new eggs in the springtime. So that didn't happen last year. Ah, Australia. Um, that's the, their prime minister, at least for the time being. They've called an election. Uh, you know, Australia is an, a very interesting country. Aussies are lovely people. They're tough people. They love the land. They love their country. They love their wine. They love their uh, free time. They guard it uh, religiously, something we could learn here a little more, I think. But uh, they are the largest coke coal producer on planet Earth. And they uh, supply mo uh, most of China's coal. Yet, they realize, as you've just seen with the um, heat dome that formed uh, three weeks ago, they have, they've really copped it hard with climate change there. They've had droughts, they've had intense floodings, not just the last couple weeks, um, two years ago, two Januaries ago, they, they really flooded I mean, viciously. They've brought in a carbon tax. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, where we're going and where Earth is going. And again, uh, I have it on very good terms that the Obama administration understands. And make no mistake, United States of America is the greatest country on the planet. Yes, we've been knocked on our backsides. We pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we are a world leader. We, will n we don't wait for other countries. We're not going to wait for India and China to do the right thing. We are going to pulse down on our carbon. I predict that in, by 2016, there, were, there will be a world ratified treaty that every nation will begin to pulse down by 5% a year, back to null or zero in 2036, or pretty close to 2036, because we've already increased uh, about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit over the last uh, since 1895 in America, uh, and 80 percent of that has happened in, since 1980. There's a very good reason why we have to cut back, apart from the droughts that are forthcoming. We cannot exceed more than another two degrees Fahrenheit because right now on planet Earth, on every forested continent, which is every continent except Antarctica, our, our mature forests are beginning to die. And after two degrees, after another increase of two degrees, we run the risk of losing the entire carbon storage capacity of our forests. Ladies and gentlemen, as a species, we cannot exist on this planet without our forests. Make no mistake. There are some scientists who've never gone outside and have never spent a night in a forest and couldn't tell a, a tree from a rock that have been running around saying, oh yes, we can go to four or five, six degrees. No, we can't. We've got another billion people coming in 10 years or less. We need every tree. One mature tree provides enough oxygen for a family of four. We cannot lose our forests. Our forests are watershed bastions. They hold water, they attract snow, they release the snow slowly in the springtime that feeds into the, the mountain valleys, recharges the rivers, the rivers run, they feed into our agriculture, they feed into our water systems. The, water is the lifeblood of this planet. We have to be very, very careful with what's ahead. This is um, the Gold Coast in Australia. This is, um, uh, this is kind of like a Malibu uh, uh, and I guess a Miami Beach in the exclusive area. This is multi, multi, multi billions in real estate. And we're starting to see some pretty epic erosion now. Uh, this isn't when three feet hit. The, on the ground, the kinds of things that we're starting to see, and Starbucks is very aware of this, the Arabica coffee bean, the uh, coffee plants are now developing on their leaves molds. And uh, coffee is a multi-billion dollar uh, crop. I'm one of the ardent supporters of Starbucks and coffee. If anybody knows me, I'm wandering around with black coffee. Starbucks is starting to focus a lot more on the Robusta bean, which is the freeze-dry, which is the instant coffee. They, they see what's coming. For those in the audience that enjoy champagne from the Champagne region of France, we're starting to see that the grapes are much higher in sugar, uh, much lower in acidity, and the harvest is at least two weeks earlier than it was a decade ago. We um, are starting to see in uh, West Africa the cocoa. The cocoa comes, cocoa is our chocolate. Valentine's is coming up. Uh, cocoa comes from cacao. It's the, the uh, bean in the pod. And uh, unless a carbon, unless we significantly pulse down, starting in 16, 2016, by over the next decade, 
Uh, West Africa runs the uh, gambit of increasing in temperature by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That will spell hundreds of thousands of co uh, cocoa or cacao farmers will be out of business in Ghana and the Ivory Coast and the chocolate that we all love will really truly become a luxury good. About 75 to 80 percent of our chocolate comes from West Africa. Also uh, we see from torrential rains in Indonesia uh, just above Australia, we have a map here, where's old Oz? Uh, anyway, it's a country, a small country, but there's 250 million people there. And uh, in 2011, they had such torrential rains that their sugar cane, they lost 40% of their sugar cane. The price of sugar spiked. We have to be very, very aware that global food security is what we're playing with here with these droughts. And uh, it starts with us becoming aware and there are a lot of uh, individual things that we can do, but most importantly, uh, I am uh, very optimistic that our government realizes that there is a problem. For every problem, there are at least three solutions. We will create industries and we will do the right thing. And by the way, by the way, innovation is our best friend in the 21st century. If 40 years ago Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were up in the front of the room and everybody told them, oh no, you're, you know, your idea about computers, <laughs> guess what? We wouldn't have our smartphones, we wouldn't have our iPads. Most of us who've owned Macs for years wouldn't have our computers. Innovation is where it is at. And it's a time where change is opportunity in disguise. And the only constant in life is change. So things will be a little bumpy, but I, I predict that we will come out ahead of the pack and I predict that we will do the right things just in the nick of time. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, no? Yes? Yes? And that presentation was done in 2005, 2006, something like that? True. Um, how are the programs that he worked on, and obviously had a lot of money in, in being able to increase awareness, how is he relating to the current uh, President Obama program and the thing that you're working on? Well, uh, up until rather recently, we were all a little concerned with what the Obama, the new Obama administration was going to say or do. And I think um, Mr. Gore was frustrated, like many, many others, that nothing was happening. Uh, I think that he, uh, like many of us, are optimistic that something, programs are going to happen. Uh, I know that uh, he's got a new book out that he's plugging, uh, and uh, he has his thoughts of uh, sustainability and future proofing uh, that are forthcoming. And I think that, uh, he too is uh, is waiting with bated breath, as we all are. Questions, comments? Question. Yep. Uh, when you look at areas like the Pacific Islands, where some of their uh, drinking supplies now are already being filled yeah. with some of the salt water, and pretty soon they're going to have an issue where their islands won't be habitable anymore. Yeah. And then you're going to end up with people having to jump from island to island, other than the food scarcity issue. Kind of a population yeah. issue where yeah. land is going to become scarce. Absolutely right. What, I mean, what's going on with bringing attention to those small communities like that who don't have as big of a voice? Well, the United Nations is well aware of it, and, and I imagine uh, their respective governments are going to try and cut deals with our nation and other Australia and other uh, close by nations to, to have to take the, the, the people because you're right, the oceans are rising and uh, they, 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 are, they will be out of business irrespective of uh, what happens. When I speak of future proofing, I don't know how many of you have seen in the Netherlands, they have these massive uh, locks that, uh, that come up that protect against the, the uh, oceans surging forward. 
certainly for New York City uh, and many other cities, uh, coastal cities in America, we will begin that. That's a massive capital outlay, good for jobs, but somebody's got to pay for it. But on these smaller islands, they can't afford that. So yeah, no, it's a, it, that is a very, uh, very big problem. And they are, they are in dialogue as we speak with the United Nations and other countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that, um, say, like Superstorm Sandy um, is just a pre precursor to what's, what, what's going to happen? Well, it, it, certainly, it certainly gives us a glim glimmer of, of what is brewing, and, and it, it adds a lot of credence to doing something now. And the something now each day on planet Earth, we are spewing out 85 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and it's collecting. So what we need to do, of course, is to, is to begin to reduce that. It, it won't ameliorate all the effects. We are going to see stronger storms, and uh, when, uh, jet when polar jet streams uh, collide, that was the other thing with Sandy, uh, that at a lower category, category two and three, why did it bring such a surge? And by the way, not only did it bring a surge to uh, New Jersey and uh, New York State, they had 18 foot waves on Lake Michigan. You know how far Lake Michigan is from the coast? That's because when the storm, the hurricane draws all its energy from the warming water. As a hurricane comes onto land, their energy source is cut. It usually it deluges and occasionally we get uh, tornadoes. But in this case, what happened is the uh, polar jet stream, similar to uh, what happened in the UK, came down and infused a bolt of energy and drove this thing steroidal. And the floods, they just finished uh, agreeing uh, on Monday to $51 billion for, uh, for relief. But imagine, people have been homeless and businesses have been in ruinous conditions up until now. And this is January and that happened in late October. Uh, again, it's not, the knee-jerk reactions here have to stop. And, and don't, don't just think, it, I'm coming up with these numbers. The hard numbers are from the insurance companies. If you look at the last 15 years, insurance companies, particularly in North America, have had to pay out about $600 billion. They're getting very, t not only tired, sure, they, they raise their rates, but uh, Lloyd's of London, for instance, said, you, you boys go up to the Arctic, we're not insuring you. And so the, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, economics behind what's coming ahead because you can't just keep, continue to hand out 51 billion here. Uh, by the way, the, we believe the price tag for Sandy uh, will exceed 100 billion. Katrina was 125 billion. These are big numbers. This, this, these are, these are, are communities, our cities. We have to begin to become proactive and not reactive. So you said every problem has three solutions. In your opinion, what are the three top viable solutions for the U.S. to tackle climate change? Well, one is where we source our energy. Make no mistake, uh, going up to the Alberta tar sands and running an XL pipeline to satisfy addicted consumers that uh, the proceeds are going in, into the pockets of a few, that is the worst case scenario. Where we need to, where we need to begin to flex is supporting our colleges and universities on innovation, on new energies. We're, we're quite advanced in solar. We, while we've been wasting time over the last four years, on saying, oh, you know, ocean energy, this, that, and the other. Our oceans globally produce two terawatts of energy, the, just the simple waves going back and forth. Around our globe, we use one terawatt of energy. And while we've been saying, oh, well, you know, maybe we should have, maybe we shouldn't, there's a few little pilot, not much. Australia, Spain, Portugal, and Scotland put in place Three, uh, pilot operational wave farms 
They've debugged them. They're ready to go into full-scale operation on harnessing ocean waves. We've got to harness ocean waves. We've, we have uh, the Obama administration in the last three weeks uh, sanctioned uh, eight more offshore wind farms, including one on Lake Erie. We've got to get more wind. We've got to get oceanic uh, uh, juice. We've got to get sun. You realize that uh, the, uh, the sun bathes our planet each hour in enough energy in one hour to power down our whole planet for one year. There's, if we're going to put people on Mars in a decade, you cannot tell me that we can't begin to refine our solar cell capacity, and we are at a nanoscale, it'll blow your mind, uh, the technologies. Ten years ago, a flat screen TV the size of this blackboard was ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Today it's 400 bucks. You ramp up the scale of economy and the price is going to come down. So I think it's how we source our energy. I think that our homes of the future, quite frankly, you'll come home with, in your electric car, you'll plug your car into your roof, certainly in Florida and California and the southern half of America, and we will be off-grid. Our homes and the way we spend energy, our entire uh, energy grid is old, it's antiquated. It needs to be redone and that's jobs. The, the uh, greatest job, uh, the job maker that we see are, are uh, the American uh, water engineers did an assessment of our water system in every town and, and every city and it's, currently it's a D minus. We're leaking billions of gallons of water every day into the soil. Well, let's peel that back. There's engineering jobs, there's uh, uh, the new pipes need to be laid, new seals put in, there's blue collar jobs, there's a decade of getting smart with our water. So we gotta be smart with our water, we gotta be smart with our energy, and we gotta put our, uh, our youth that are coming out of college into new sectors that are long term and sustainable. And lastly, I would say we got to protect our honeybees. We've lost a quarter of a trillion honeybees. And the makers, uh, uh, Bear Crop Science, if there's anybody in the audience uh, from Bear, ha ha, um, they're making, each year they put 1.25 billion uh, tons of neonicotinoid poison into our biosphere that is unequivocally killing the bees. That's got to be, that's got to end. What we do, to our oceans and our land we do to ourselves. We cannot continue to kill bees. Any other questions? Yep. So if in 2016 we get a you know, treaty ratified yep. and countries start to reduce their carbon emissions 5% every year, mm -hmm. do you foresee that there could be a reversal of some of these effects or rehabilitation? And if so, how, how long would it take? Um, well, it, it won't go away. We, the wild weather is, is here. Uh, we don't want it to get any worse. Uh, the, oceans are, uh, the oceans definitely need to be, 50% of our oceans need to be placed in a, what we call a no-take zone. They need to rehabilitate. That will at least begin to rehabilitate the, the fish stocks. It won't uh, rectify the, uh, uh, the acidity. We're not there, there's several labs working on a global plan, I think, to try and uh, combat a rising acidity. That, that is a very big problem. Um, I think that it's, gonna, it's really going to test our metal, uh, uh, the, the growing food, um, the GMOs uh, and the bees and, uh, and how we... Uh, I, I, I'm thinking that it, 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 we need to empower each of us if you have a home, I strongly suggest planting at least one, but preferably two, fruit trees because they will fall as well bear food. I think that we each need to be aware of a, a growing, having a little patch of land and, and growing food. Incidentally, I saw an amazing thing. There was a, a fellow in Perth, Australia. And he had an idea. He, he went to a, uh, then a council person and said, you know, we have all this concrete everywhere on the footpath and, 
And um, it's so dry in Perth, they don't have any lawns. They, they're not allowed to have lawns. They, they have sand. And he convinced them to pull out most of the concrete on the sidewalk and, and on the, the middle sections of the roads. He said, let's plant, what if we plant uh, plants and, and food? And they said, well, okay, let's try it. And they did. And not only did it catch on in one area, the mayor said, yes, let's do it. And the whole city of a million people is growing uh, food on, on the, in, in front of their homes. Now what that's doing is you see cities are masses of concrete. Concrete is, is a heat sink. So the sun comes down, heats the concrete, and cities are what we call urban heat islands. Uh, the work that was uh, uh, released earlier this week now shows that urban heat islands can affect climate and the weather a thousand miles away. So we got to get rid of this concrete. There's another good reason why we got to get rid of as much concrete as we can. These intense rains are bringing uh, 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 mega amounts of runoff which are overwhelming our, our sewer systems and uh, creating damage. So uh, we're, we're looking at uh, painting rooftops white because the white uh, mimics the ice that's missing. It also keeps the home cooler. You don't need to be a physicist. Go anywhere to the Med in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean. They don't have dark rooftops. Everything's white. So uh, just cooler natural methods. I mean, even here in the summer, instead of uh, cranking your AC down, if it's 90 outside, set your AC to 80. It'll be, you know, a little bit uh, uh, warmer inside, but not that much warmer. The air conditioning units are our real deal because uh, over the last decade or more, as um, the disposable income and the middle class has increased in India, India is a country of 1.1 billion people. They've got, you know, two, three hundred million middle class people. China, two, three hundred middle class people. Disposable income. Got disposable income? Hell, I'm going to buy myself a big old air conditioning unit. More energy. I don't know if you remember this summer. India lost power and 400 million people were without electricity. I don't know if you've ever lost electricity and you're in a city and it, you know 10 minutes is one thing, but when it's hot and you lose it for half a day or a day, it freaks you out. So we've got to be, we have to be careful uh, and I think, we're, I think we're starting to see it and I, I'm, I'm a fervent believer that President Obama's legacy has to be to, to, to say to the rest of the nations, we are going to, we're all in this together, we're going to pulse down and we're going to make our economies work. And I think, quite frankly, it's going to stimulate uh, work and jobs in America. And there's, there's, there's a zillion made in American solutions right here, right in this state and in every other state. So um, we don't have any alternative. Maybe 20 years ago or so, they came out with incinerators, and so all the incinerators were installed in all the major cities, and all the trash was taken to incinerators. Yeah. What are the incinerators doing to damage the environment? Well, a uh, big a lot, but a bit even worse. What the there's a there's a major difference, many major differences culturally and uh, um, at a at a at a basic human level, but. 80 years ago, or 90 years ago, when our grandparents went through the Depression, people were very thrifty. Stuff that was made in America was made well. Lasted 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I remember we grew up, we had a toaster. Our toaster lasted 35 years. Today, we, we build stuff, we build stuff with, Today, we're, we're, we're not aware that everybody is entitled to a fair share. So we think, oh, we'll get a toaster for eight bucks, and whoop de doo it lasts for a short while, we'll just throw it away. We are a, we are a wasteful, we are a profligate uh, nation. We don't mean to be, 
but we are throwing away every year 242 million tons of trash. Putting it in terms of blue whales, every day of the calendar year in America, we are throwing away 6,750 blue whales, trucking it away. Where does it go? I don't know, it just goes to the landfill. Not cool. Those landfills are, and in the landfills, we're putting heavy metals, we're putting batteries, we're putting lead. Guess what? In the, in the landfill, as that starts to decompose and rot, the first thing is the heavy metals are seeping into the groundwater. What we do to the water, we do to ourselves. That water is then sometimes winding up in our glass or our, on our agricultural fields. Not acceptable. We, ought, we know that there are thermal conversion pits where they line the pit. They put a cap on it. One of the problems with our landfills is as they decompose, they release methane. Methane is 70 to 100 times more powerful at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. So, let's use innovation. We cap it like a slow cooker. Everybody familiar with a slow cooker? You slow cook the trash as the methane comes off you siphon it, you use the methane to power down the system, and after a half a year or so of slow cooking, it renders everything neutral. The, the, the pit is lined, so it's impervious. The toxicity cannot go into the ground. We've got to be aware of, of what we're doing, and it's a, it's a major rethink. Uh, I, I'm sure that... Um, there are many multinationals right now who've got branch plants in China and elsewhere who are using the Pacific Ocean as a whatever moment. They're not paying a tax. Guess what? They're running big boats from China to America across the largest ocean in the world and they're not paying for their carbon footprint. That's going to change real quickly. And I, I see that as a good thing because I see that we're going to start to make things here in America make things that don't break and become thrifty. Now today, if your toaster breaks, in the old days, and toast, our, our family toaster, fine, at Westinghouse, or little toaster, beauty, it eventually, uh, an element went. What do we do? Took the toaster to a toaster guy. Little guy, he fixed it. Back to where it is. Now it, uh, there are no little, the little toaster guys are gone. We just throw them out. I think we're going to start to see uh, uh, we're going to become thrifty. We need to become thrifty. There is nothing wrong with becoming thrifty. Yeah? Is there any source that you know of where if one wanted to look up a list of innovations that are being worked on that would be helpful in the world? Is there, is there a particular place at all where one could look for a variety of sure there are oh yeah yeah uh, uh, on our uh, some of our Facebook postings on waves of change uh, global healing blue community, blue community. Uh, we've got I've got a new book coming out next week um, shameless plug but what the <laughs> hell <laughs> it's an ebook uh, and um, you can find it on my website drreese.com uh, life, the wonder of it all. There's, uh, there's lots of references. Uh, and there's an entire burgeoning new field called biomimicry. Biomimicry is the future. And I'll tell you why. Because one selfish reason why we need to keep our oceans and our forests intact, because they've got all the answers to our human problems. We've been, Dave and I have been consulted, I've been consulted, my colleagues have been consulted on problems that have arisen at businesses and we have said, hmm, I wonder how we, well, let me think about that. So your Speedo uh, swimsuits and you, you come to me and you say, you know, we'd like to make a bathing suit that repels water. What, what do you know about that? Hmm, what do we know? Oh, yeah, sharks. Dude, they're very cool. Ever seen shark skin? Shark skin has uh, dent, uh, dermicles, and it's rough. They're like little, they're like mini waves is what they are. And why? Because 
the rappel water laminar flow. Now you're thinking I'm on a tangent. No, no, I'm not on a tangent at all. As a matter of fact, Michael Phelps and all of the uh, Olympians in our, in our, uh, on our team and around the world for the last 20 years have been hopping in the Olympic pools wearing shark skin bathing suits, fat skin bathing suits. Now, why is that important? Well, right now on planet Earth, we have a war taking place. Not reported for unknown reasons to me. We have wars on everything. We got a war against nature. We are slaughtering nature. I mean, we are, we are eviscerating nature. We, we've got a, a situation here where we've killed over a billion sharks over the last decade. Now you might say, ah, oh, sharks, who cares? I got a big uh, a flat screen TV. I saw them once on Discovery. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, dude, I watch Jaws and now I'm afraid to go into the water. Hooey. Sharks are very important. There's 400 species of sharks and rays. They are apex predators at the top of the food chain. They keep their prey healthy. They cull the sick, the weak, and they keep diseases from running rampant or becoming an epidemic in our ocean. For some unknown reason, sharks, there is a war against them because 300 years ago in Asia, the royalty ate shark fin soup. Uh, ever seen the fin on the, the dorsal fin on the back of a shark? You probably have, everybody has. Uh, what is it? Well, it's cartilage, it's the same stuff in your knee. Does it have any medicinal value? No. However, it, ha it just so happens that, through no fault of their own, there's two or three hundred million middle-class Asian people, actually probably closer to half a billion. They have a disposable income. They want to pretend that they ha they've got Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, muscle and they want to be able to do what they do. So they have shark fin soup. It's available for banquets. It's available for weddings. It's available for anybody who can pay 15 bucks a bowl for a shark fin soup. Ever seen a shark on a boat that is skinned alive? They take that, they take a, these beautiful critters, they pull them up on the ocean, uh, out of the ocean, they cut the, the, the shark fin off and then they throw the critter back in the ocean live to bleed to death and to experience unbelievable pain. This kind of action is incorrigible and it cannot happen because the oceans are what we call the commons. They belong to our grandchildren. We've got to take care of the oceans. Selfishly, now again, say you don't really care about Michael Phelps and the ocean and, and the Olympic program and swimming. Ha ha, everybody cares about cancer. Oh, cancer and sharks? Yes. Apparently, sharks don't have any cancer. What are we doing? We're studying why these incredible apex top predators don't have cancer. There's answers to human longevity by keeping these kids alive. And that's one critter out of many. So the biomimicry, biomimicry is, in my opinion, if you took one industry, Biomimicry is what is going to save and provide our grandchildren with their legacy because they're jobs. We've got new, uh, our paints that, that don't bleed any volatile organic compounds and no metals. Those paints came from uh, barnacles and, uh, and um, snails and the mucus and they, they dry quickly they're a lubricant, they're a glue. Anybody ever been into a kelp forest? Kelp forest is like this underwater trip, 200 foot green walls of heaven, and they're going back and forth. Ever wonder how a 200 foot plant in the ocean getting pulled to and fro can hang on? Look at the base, the hold fast. From the hold fast, some of the best new non-toxic glues in the world come from hold fast. Now, ever seen a starfish? Starfish are incredible. They're very brittle. How can a brittle starfish hang out at the interface of the tide when the, when the tide comes in and they get smashed by uh, the, the wave? Turns out that the, although it's calcium carbonate, there'd be another critter that's going to get kicked from the, uh, the acidity in the ocean. The way they derive their strength is by crisscrossing the laminate composites in their in their architecture. 
Why does this matter, uh, uh, Tinkers? I'll tell you why it matters. Because the stiffener inside every tire on every car or truck on the globe has the exact same crisscross formation so that the, the uh, tire doesn't blow apart really quickly. Starfish inspired our tires of the 21st century. There are so many examples in biomimicry and every college and every engineering department and, every, and many companies have people searching the planet to help solve problems. The caveat is we need nature in some semblance as a working system so that people who spend their lives looking at systems can go, oh yeah, you got a water repellent pro a problem or thing? let's look at shark skin. Ooh, plus we need our sharks. Anything else? <laughs>